Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Jaka Jakšić, I work on Google Translate. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Douglas Fields. He is a neuroscientist and an international authority on brain development, neuron glia interactions, and the cellular mechanisms of memory. He is currently Chief of Nervous System Development and Plasticity Section at the National Institutes of Health. And he is the author of many magazine articles and books, including Why We Snap, which you can uh, grab in the back if you haven't yet. And later we're going to have a quick uh, book signing. Um, and his other book is The Other Brain. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Douglas Fields. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. It's a, a delight to be here. Um, so I've been given the rare opportunity to talk about two books in one hour. Um, normally, either one of these subjects would take a whole hour. So uh, I apologize. I'm going to go really quick, and I'm going to only be able to hit the high points. Um, but uh, you know, I realize here at Google, your, your CPUs are overclocked, and you'll be able to do this. But uh, we'll get through it. And the first talk is uh, related to uh, the subject of snapping. Um, so this is a, a very interesting topic that I think touches everyone in one way or another. Um, many people won't admit it, but everyone admits they know somebody else who has issues. Uh, and snapping's bewildering because it's this unconscious, aggressive impulse that's triggered by something in the environment. And it's not conscious, it's not deliberate. Why break a dish? Why smash a tennis racket? Why get into ve vehicular jousting on the freeway and, and, and wreck your car or worse? It doesn't make any sense. So that's what snapping is, it's this, and that's what's disturbing about it is that it's not conscious, it's rapid, triggered by something in the environment, and the, the behavior is incorrect, right? Um, it's followed by regret, uh, so it's kind of embarrassing. If, if it's appropriate behavior, we call it we don't call it snapping, we call it quick thinking or something like that. Um, so it um, is interesting because this uh, covers an unconscious uh, part of the brain that we're talking about. Um, and it seemed to me that um, this is a new subject, but a very important and overlooked subject. When I read the newspapers every day, we re read about the violence and you know, domestic disputes, barroom brawls, all these kinds of things. And you know, it's not mentally ill people. Uh, mental illness, uh, people with mental illness do not commit violent acts any more than anyone else. Um, and so we do understand how drugs can uh, interfere uh, with judgment, but I think we're overlooking the big issue, the majority of, of uh, what we call snapping or violence that we read about every day is so-called normal people. Um, and I'd like to understand how, how that works um, but it's actually broader than snapping. When you, you uh, get into the subject, the book has more than that because it's talking about, it involves the neural circuitry of unconscious behaviors and threat detection. What's different about this approach in the book is it's not a psychological approach that you may be familiar with. It's a neuroscience approach, which we look at snapping as a behavior. All behaviors are controlled by the brain. Let's go in the brain and see what circuits mediate this behavior. It's only been possible with new methods of neuroscience. So that's, that's the, uh, the new approach. Um, and also, uh, unconscious operation of the brain, but also fear and whatnot. So the point is, we're all wired for violence. We don't have to be taught violence. Um, all animals need to have this aggressive behavior in order to uh, protect themselves, to protect their offspring. Carnivals need to have aggressive behavior in order to uh, capture food. Um, it's The circuits that carry this out are not in the conscious part of the brain. They're in the unconscious part of the brain, called the hypothalamus and other circuitry. And that's what I'd like to talk about, is the circuitry of snapping. So, um, and aggressive behavior. We're all wired for violence, and in order to give you an idea of what made me realize that, I want to read a snippet out of my book, because this is what inspired me to try to understand. Uh, it was an instance where I snapped, and uh, I wanted to realize if I could risk my life or limb in an instant in, in response to something in my environment, I wanted to know how that worked <laughs> and not be consciously uh, uh, aware of it. Okay, so um, 
After Paris, we traveled to Barcelona for my next lecture at an international meeting of neuroscientists. The morning before the meeting began, we made a quick visit to the Gaudi Cathedral. Ascending the steps out of the dingy subway station, smelling of concrete dust and sweat, we emerged in the brilliant Barcelona sun. A crowd of passengers pressed upon us in a gray blur. So I was traveling to a neuroscience meeting, and I brought my 17-year-old daughter with me. That's very unusual. Usually I travel alone. So we thought we'd go see the Gaudi Cathedral before I give my lecture. So we're coming up out of the subway si system. Suddenly, I felt a sharp tug at my pant leg. As if swatting a mosquito, I slapped a zipper pocket above my left knee. Lee, knee. My wallet was gone. My left arm shot back blindly. In a flash, I clotheslined the robber as he pivoted to hand my wa wallet off to his partner and flee down the steps. As if swinging a sledgehammer, I hurled him by his neck over my left hip and slammed him belly first onto the pavement, where I flattened him to the ground and applied a headlock. Splaying my legs for hip control like a wrestler pinning an opponent, I yelled for help. All right, 56 years old, 130 pounds, wire rim glasses, gray hair. Um, I have no martial arts training. <laughs> I have no military experience, no background in street fighting. Drawing on junior high school wrestling moves 40 years ago, I found myself applying an illegal chokehold. The street smart hoodlum struggling in my arms was in his late 20s, or early 30s. Police, I shouted. Call the police, I've got him. Well, there was no reply. No gasps of shock from the dense crowd. No one was coming to my aid. Instead, from my perspective on the ground, all I saw were men's feet closing in around me in a tight circle. They were all part of the gang. Oblivious to being hunted as prey, we assumed that the crowd was the normal throng of passengers bumping and jostling through the Barcelona metro system. The muscled man beneath me struggled to break my grip. With his neck in the crook of my left arm, I cinched with all the force my biceps could produce, cutting the blood off to his brain and air to his lungs. Bending his head back, I torqued his spine backward painfully, tipping his face skyward. His eyes and mouth opened wide in shock, pain, and fear. The wallet popped free as he tossed it toward his accomplice and grasped furiously at my arm to break my strength. That's my wallet, I yelled. A woman's hand shot between the thicket of legs. Instantly, I recognized it as my daughter's. She had been cut off by the gang that had encircled and trapped us, encircling me silently like a pack of wolves. Captain of the ultimate football <laughs> frisbee team, Kelly dove through the air in an arc as if to deflect the disc inches from an opponent's grasp in a full-on layout on the solid concrete. She intercepted the pass in mid-air and tipped the wallet into the palm of my outstretched right hand. Reading the eyes on an accomplice fixating on my blackberry spinning on the pavement, she lunged again and beat him to the prize. With my wallet retrieved and realizing that I was horribly outnumbered, I <coughs> released the thief and bounced to the balls of my feet as he scurried backwards on his butt like an injured crab escaping. Crazy man, he gasped. Looking into the eyes of the half dozen muscular thugs surrounding me, I tried to discern if he choked out those parting words to deflect suspicion or if he meant it as a threat. Now what? A massive surge of adrenaline fueled my twitching muscles and nerves to levels of raw power I had never felt before. I was now struggling not to pick him up the next hoodlum squaring off with me, hoist him over my head and hurl him into the accomplices, knocking them all down the steps of the metro station like bowling pins. Now, it wasn't a question of whether I could execute the superhuman feat. I had no doubt that I could do it. I was charged with adrenaline. Rather, I was trying not to do it simply because this might not be my best move, at least not yet. Suddenly, a middle-aged, well-dressed Spaniard stepped casually between me and the attackers, and with flicking shoeing motions of his fingers, he said, he know crazy, go now. Without breaking stride, he descended the steps into the metro station. As he passed me, he smiled and said, bueno, good, go now. In passing, he had deflected the situation to its best possible outcome, a draw. The band of robbers scattered into the metro station like rats down a sewer, leaving my daughter and me standing there stunned, my wallet clenched in a death grip in my right hand. Unfortunately, that was not the end of it. The gang pursued Kelly and me throughout the city for the next two hours. They were not after my wallet anymore. I had humiliated and beaten up a member of their gang. They wanted revenge. I tried every trick to elude them, fleeing into tourist shops and through noisy restaurants, cutting through back alleys, abruptly crossing streets to reverse course, changing clothing, and when they got too close, leaving the sidewalk and running down the center of the boulevard, weaving through oncoming cars. At one point, we stopped traffic to jump into a taxi in the middle of a three-lane boulevard, but they had cell phones. 
And everywhere we went, they sent increasingly menacing tattooed thugs with steroid bloated biceps to intercept us. As we dodged the gang of robbers, we witnessed them casually pick wallets from two more tourists. I even snapped photographs of them doing it, a stupid mistake as it turned out, because the lookout on my side of the street caught me doing it. The unshaven goon came running up the sidewalk, jabbering Russian into a cell phone and extending a video camera in an unconvincing attempt to pass as a tourist. We fled down the side street. As they closed in on us, we were forced to jump into a taxi and escape to a small town an hour away. In the cab, my daughter asked in a tone filled with shock and disbelief, where did you learn to do that? I looked over and saw you swinging some guy around by the neck. I couldn't figure out what was happening. I laughed in ner nervous relief. 170 euro cab fare later, we were broke but safe. And now my daughter is convinced that my job at the National Institutes of Health is just a cover for my real job as a spy. <laughs> All right, so I realized there I was on the ground. And suddenly this thought bubbles up to my head, what the heck are you doing? So the point is the neural circuitry involved in that behavior didn't involve my cerebral cortex. And that's because when you're faced with a sudden uh, threatening situation, conscious uh, deliberation is too slow. Your conscious brain can't hold it, um, and it can't hold enough information, and it operates too slowly. So the brain's threat detection mechanism is subcortical, unconscious. Um, and the wiring for this is uh, in, in uh, the amygdala and in uh, the hypothalamus. So as I was uh, wandering around Barcelona with my daughter, consciously engaged in where we're going to go, my threat de detection mechanism was looking at threats. And that's happening with all of you. You're constantly, half your, a huge part of your brain devoted to threat detection and on the lookout for threats. So all the sensory information, before it goes to your cerebral cortex, vision, sound, goes to the center of your threat detection mechanism in the amygdala. That's why you can dodge a basketball, get it out of the way, and then you go, what was that? That was visual information going to your amygdala. And then later, it goes to your cerebral cortex, but you've already acted. So um, um, in the early 20s, Walter Hess, uh, stuck electrodes into a cat brain and stimulated different parts of the brain. And he found one part in the hypothalamus. When he stimulated this, the cat launched into a, an attack and would kill another animal in its cage. So this area is called the hypothalamic attack area. And uh, this is true in other animals, and humans have it as well. So this, the question is, what feeds into this attack area to cause this violent response? Um, and the new information is showing that very uh, discrete circuits feed into this area in response to different threats. Aggressive behavior is highly regulated. You're not going to engage in aggression for anything but very, except very specific reasons because you're risking your life and limb. So it's highly regulated. Now, although it seems that anything can trigger aggression when you read the paper, in fact, very few things can. Only nine different things, and these involve different circuits. So um, this, uh, what has, uh, scientists have been able to do in recent years is use new methods, optogenetics, and uh, to genetic engineering, so you can engineer neurons to release flashes of light when they fire, stick a fiber optic camera into an experimental animal, have it engage in aggression, and see which neurons light up, and now you know the circuitry. You can activate and inactivate specific neurons by shining a laser into the brain and neurons that are genetically uh, encoded to respond to that light by firing or inhibiting. So now you can turn on behaviors, uh, different aggressive behaviors. What this line of research has shown is that very specific behaviors like maternal aggression, you're familiar, we're all familiar with maternal aggression. If you threaten a mother's uh, young, then the, the mother will attack. Um, Using these methods I've talked about, you can see that circuitry. You can activate those circuits with a laser and activate the mother to uh, exhibit aggressive behavior against an intruder. You can inactivate that, and the mother will no longer protect her pups. However, she still will have aggressive responses to different kinds of threats. So this has led to realizing that our threat detection mechanism, unlike the old idea of the lizard brain, the primitive part of the brain causes you to do beastly things. No, we have very elaborate, exquisite um, uh, neural circuitry to release aggression in response to specific triggers. So um, 
let me uh, tell you about the triggers. <laughs> and again, these are based on neurocircuitry, not on some classification. And if you read the neuroscience behaviorists, physiologists, and psychologists, they all have different uh, terminology for aggression, different kinds of aggression. I've dispensed with that, and for two reasons. I thought that it would be helpful to understand the mechanisms to have a mnemonic so that you could remember these nine circuits that will trigger aggression. And secondly, this will also allow you to control the circuitry. Because in fact, we have these circuits because we need them. You don't want to prevent uh, this response in the right circumstance. You just want to prevent the misfires. So if you can suddenly feel the sense of rage on the highway, let's say, um, and understand which of these life morts triggers, I, the mnemonic I created was life morts, then you can control the rage response because you'll realize it's a misfire and the rage will, will subside. So there's not gonna be time to go through all these triggers, um, but I'll just uh, quickly uh, talk about some. Um, L for life and limb, we've already talked about um, you know, uh, defensive aggression. If you're attacked, you will fight back. Uh, any animal will. Um, we also mentioned uh, maternal aggression. That's the F in, in life morts. Um, the E trigger is environment. Many animals are territorial, and they will def defend their territory aggressively. The market, they'll fiercely defend intruders. Uh, primates and humans are, are fiercely territorial. Uh, intruders will be shot. Somebody enters your house unannounced, uh, it's going to trigger an aggressive response. So that's the, uh, the E trigger. I'm um, just going to give you another example. I can't go through them all. T is for tribe. Social animals use aggression to protect their group. Many animals will have this. Um, and certainly human beings uh, have this capability as well. I mean, the selective service system proves that we all have the capability for violence uh, and destruction to protect our country, for example. Um, so that's the T for tribe trigger. I mean, we need to realize how, that's also the key to our success, that we can go shirts and skins and play at the maximal physical, mental capability of a human being on a basketball court, just arbitrarily divide into two teams. This is what got us to the moon. We compete with another country. Um, so this is really the key to uh, our success as a species, but it also leads to racism, leads to wars, it leads to gang violence. Uh, so those are two of the triggers that, that I want to mention. Um, and I just don't have time to go through them all, but I want to give one, make one more point. We have these circuits embedded in our brain because we have the same brain we had 100,000 years ago when we lived in the plains of Africa and we were fighting tooth and nail uh, for, fight for sur survival. Same brain, but we're now operating in an environment our brain was never evolved to operate in completely different world. So what happens is you get misfires triggered by situations in the modern world that never existed. Driving is a great example. It hits almost all these triggers. Uh, so I'll just give you one, and it's the E-trigger. So you're out on 101, you're driving on the freeway, somebody cuts in front of you, suddenly you're feeling enraged, and some people will, you know, end in a gun battle or, or a wreck, but we all, many people, will feel the sudden rage when somebody does that. Why? why? Why do we feel anger? Why don't we feel some other emotion? That's a misfire. We perceive the area around our car as our territory. Somebody's intruded into our territory, tripped this trigger for us to defend it. For the purpose of the activity we're involved in, transportation, it doesn't matter if the guy's on your front bumper or your back bumper, it's a matter of a couple of seconds difference. But it's this illusion that we're traveling with territory. If you're running and having a foot race over the ground, that never happens. People are free to run ahead of you. Somebody cuts in front of you and it's faster, you might laugh, you wouldn't get angry. So um, that's an example of, of a misfire. So the point is we have these circuits because we need them. They exist because they are uh, important to our survival. Um, and it's, it's, not a, you know, it's not necessarily a, uh, a disorder, but a, but a misfiring. And I want to give an example again, read a snippet out of the book uh, that demonstrates why we have these uh, triggers. Um, and just say that in many cases, 
The same thing happens when you have a hero will come to the aid of somebody and they say, well, what were you thinking when you did that? And they say, I didn't think, I just reacted. And afterwards they're shaking, but they, they were heroic. So here's an uh, a snippet from the book. Lucky, what are you doing? Get your butt up here, let's go. Heather Lucky Penny was 26 year old DC Air National Guard Lieutenant stationed in Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. Jolted by urgency, she aborted the methodical checklist, climbed in, ignited the engines, and screamed for a ground crew to pull the wheel chocks. Within minutes, the petite blonde was piloting the F-16 fighter jet, screeching at top speed through the crystal blue sky with her commander, Colonel Mark Sasseville, piloting his own jet on her wing. The date was September 11, 2001. Both the Twin Towers and the Pentagon had just been hit. There was a fourth passenger jet commandeered by Islamic terrorists targeting the United States Capitol and the White House. Obviously, Heather knew there was no chance that any of the men, women, and children on board United Airlines 757 passenger jet she was intent on intercepting would survive. In an improbable twist of fate, there was a good chance that Heather Penny's own father could be the captain on United Flight 93, which she was determined to destroy. It sounds cold-hearted, I mean, that was my daddy, Penny said in an interview afterwards. I couldn't think about it. I had a job to do, she said later to her mom. We don't train to bring down airliners, Colonel Sasseville said, describing the gut-wrenching, unthinkable act he and Heather Penny were about to commit. Training would have been useless in any case. Neither of their jets was armed. No one had anticipated the need to have fully armed fighter jets at the ready to protect against an aerial attack originating from within the United States. I'm gonna go for the cockpit, Sasseville said. I'll take the tail, Penny replied without hesitation. I genuinely believe that this was going to be the last time I took off, she said, now a single mom with two girls. I had already given myself up knowing what my duty was. She was fully committed to ramming her jet into the passenger plane to bring it down. As fate would have it, her father, Colonel John Penny, was not piloting United 93 that morning. It was his good friend, Jason Dahl. With Jason on the plane, it would have been an additional level of grief, John Penny said later. But Lieutenant Penny and Colonel Sasseville never had to execute their kamikaze mission. Let's roll, said 32-year-old Todd Beamer, a passenger on the hijacked fat flight. Those were the last words of the soon-to-be father ending his conversation with telephone switchboard operator Lisa Jefferson, whom he had been relaying information to for the last 13 minutes of the hijacking. They had just finished reciting the Lord's Prayer and Psalms 23 together. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Beamer and the other passengers stormed the hijackers. Jeremy Glick was a six-foot judo champion. Mark Bingham was a rugby player. Tom Burnett had been a college quarterback. Lewis Knack was a weightlifter. William Cashman, a former paratrooper. The cockpit recorder captures the sound of food carts ramming the cockpit door and the cries of terrorists screaming at one another to hold the door closed. The door bursts open. Let's get them, is heard on the recording as passengers overwhelm the terrorists. They were the true heroes, Heather Penny says. And these were average, everyday Americans who gave their lives to save countless more. The selflessness reminds us that we are a part of something greater than ourselves, that there are things in this world more important than ourselves. Today, there's a memorial on the green pastures of southwestern Pennsylvania, and the White House in the United States Capitol stands spared from the destruction. This is the power of the tribe trigger to life-risking violence. Gangs, wars, racism are its ugly dark side. But this bit of neural circuitry is very much a part of what makes us human. It can unleash the best in human nature, selfless sacrifice for others. It is the trigger of heroism. And as the monument now standing in the fields of Pennsylvania reminds us, it's a vital part of every one of us. So we have these circuits for a reason. Um, I can't, in the interest of time, I have to come to a close. Um, I, uh, other important points that I would like to make is that stress is important. Knowing the circuits is important because you can control it, but understanding that stress changes the threshold. If you're in a stressful environment, um, you're more likely to have these trip, same as the military putting its defense mechanism on, on high alert. 
Uh, if you grow up in bad part of Palo Alto or Baltimore, you're gonna wire the brain so that you have a hair trigger because you can't afford to be victimized. Um, and I don't wanna give away the book, but well, I will. <laughs> um, I reacted that way in Barcelona because we were under intense stress. That was the second time we were robbed. And my amygdala had learned that. And didn't talk to my cortex about it, but it wasn't gonna happen again. The second point I'd like to make is that this mechanism, threat detection mechanism, is controlled by the cerebral cortex. And there are people who are completely nonviolent. I interviewed them, um, James, for example, who, who will kill nothing and uh, no living animal. And um, so it is possible to have cortical control over this, this circuitry. I spoke uh, to uh, Teal, a SEAL Team 6 member, told him what I did in Barcelona. He said, yeah, I never would have done that. You know, here's a guy who could take out a pickpocket with a judo chop you know, while I'm doing a selfie, and he wouldn't have done it. And they train so that they, that they, um, that they can control, with cortical control, these defensive behaviors. Um, the other thing I wish I had time to talk about is gender. The most important factor in aggression is gender. 94% of all um, uh, criminals in prison for violent crime are male. Um, but 94% of the people who have been given awards for heroism by the Carnegie Foundation are male. A quarter of those died instantly giving their life, often for a stranger, to come to their aid. Um, so gender is very important. The neuroscience of that is very interesting. Men and women face different threats. Their threat detection wiring is different. I wish I could go into that. Um, let's see. Um, I'll just end on one thing, that it has been known for some time that stimulating the hypothalamic attack region in animals Induce, in addition to inducing aggression, can induce copulation. So, you know, through, his, through literature and psychology, there's always this connection between sex and violence. Now, what we never knew is that if you stimulate this hypothalamic region, are you stimulating nerve fibers that are just passing by your electrode and the neurons are somewhere else in the brain? Well, it turns out, recent work by uh, David Anderson and his colleagues at Caltech, um, using the new methods, optogenetics, that found that they stimulate neurons in the hypothalamic region. The same neurons control copulation and aggression. And they use a, uh, a laser, fiber optic laser, to stimulate these neurons and they can switch, with the flip of a switch, make this mouse go from mating to fighting. Um, so that's interesting. So in conclusion, I, I want to say that um, you know, understanding is the first step in controlling anything. So I hope that people can understand um, that we all have this circuitry, how it works, that it's amazingly uh, intricate and elaborate circuit. I hope that people can benefit from understanding uh, how it can misfire and that we do need better ways to, to control aggression. Uh, and particularly these days when we have so much aggression that is, you know, the police are always looking for a motive. I understand what they say when looking for a motive, but there is no motive. It's a rage-induced um, violence. And that's what I hope that we can begin to understand by getting a neuroscience perspective to go along with the uh, perspective of psychology and behavior. So that's it for why we snap. Thank you. Now, for something completely different. I have to go to my second talk. I tell you, either of these talks is over an hour, and the Q&A is the best part, but we just don't have time. So let's talk about the other brain. Um, throughout my career, I've studied how neurons are wired together in development, how they change the strength of their synaptic connections through experience, and how they store memories. But did you know that only 15% of the cells in your brain are neurons? What are the other 85%? Well, they're called glia. The word means glue, and that's how they've been regarded. It's just packing material. Glia do not fire electrical impulses. Uh, so they're considered the cellular domestic servants of neurons. They clean up after neurons, they remove neurotransmitters and maintain the ionic balance. They certainly respond to injury and disease. But in recent years, neuroscientists have come to realize 
that uh, these cells do far more than anyone expected. Excuse me, I'm trying to stay on time, okay. These cells do far more than anyone ever expected. In fact, they're involved, glia are involved in every aspect of brain function in health and disease, and they're overturning our century-old assumption about how the brain works. So this is what I call the other brain. It's an exciting new frontier of science that's only now being explored. So I want to describe to you the major kinds of glial cells, tell you some of the things they do. I'm gonna to have to skip a lot of things they do. Um, hit the high points. And I, um, some of this works from my lab, uh, but most of it comes from discoveries from around the world. And uh, I'm speaking here today in a personal capacity um, and not representing in an official way the NIH at all. Uh, but first, let's trace back to the roots and the story and try to understand how we could have overlooked half the brain, especially brain scientists. So this is the object of our fascination. You know, all our thoughts, our intellect, our emotions, our compassion, hate, reasoning, perceptions, creativity, music, art, everything comes out of this bodily organ. Our unconscious automatic responses, our respiration control, temper temperature control, uh, kinds of things I was just talking about, uh, threat detection, our personality, and our identity, um, our, our, our memories, our cycles of sleep, all of this comes from two and a half pounds of flesh that can think. Yet to look at it, we don't have an idea how it does any of those things. And the reason is that the working parts of the brain are so concentrated and minute, they're invisible to the human eye. Yet our fundamental um, idea about how the brain works hasn't changed in 100 years. We're so accustomed to this analogy of the brain working as an electronic circuit that it's difficult for us to think that it might operate in any other way, but it could. And it's hard for us to realize that when this electric circuit analogy was proposed, it was seen as revolutionary and controversial. So our understanding of how the brain works is based on an Italian neuroscientist, uh, Golgi, who developed a staining method that allowed us for the first time to see neurons. And you imagine their excitement when they looked at these exquisite cells unlike anything else in the body. Ramon and Cajal, looking at the same tissue using the same method, method saw something entirely different. Golgi saw that neurons were connected into a hydraulic network. Hydraulics was the most advanced science of the day. That's why we probably think of the brain working like a computer today, because that's the most advanced science. But he saw it as hydraulics. All of these uh, pathways are hooked together. But um, Cajal was, a, was an artist before he was a scientist. And he had an ability to, deter, to determine function from form. And um, looking at the same material, he had a sudden insight that um, neurons were not connected together, that they, each one was separate. And each neuron was separated by a gulf of separation, which he called synapse. And he saw logic, that's what these arrows are. He realized that the neurons are polarized, that information passes one way through neurons, in through the dendrites and out through the axons. So all of our ideas about how the brain work is based on this idea, the neuron doctrine. And that is that um, communication and information processing in the brain takes place by electrical signals flowing through neurons, communicating across synapses. But in the last few years, scientists have become startled to realize that this assumption is not entirely correct. Now, Cajal made these uh, insightful discoveries with the simple tools, razor blades, simple microscopes. Here he is working in his kitchen. Uh, so it's amazing. You can't even see a synapse with a light microscope. It's smaller than you can see. Today, we use the most advanced electron microscopy high, uh, supercomputers. This is from Mark Ellisman's lab in UC San Diego in order to study, uh, to understand neural structure. Here's uh, from his lab, one neuron. Um, uh, one neuron can have up to 100,000 synapses. That's what these little spines are on these dendrites. Your brain and spinal cord are comprised of 100 billion neurons. All have to be connected, correct? Um, but, you know, this is not a vacuum of outer space over here except in our thinking. So let's look at what the tissue really looks like, again, from Mark Ellisman's lab. What we're doing now is going into the brain of a rat, electron microscope level, peeling away a layer at a time. Here's a blood vessel. There is a nucleus. Here are the axons going by. The point is, only 15% of what you're seeing are neurons. And at this magnification, you can't even see synapses. There's gotta be enormous communication going on that were uh, among these cells that is non-synaptic and non-neuronal. 
Uh, and look at the intricate circuitry you're talking about, and I think you can appreciate what Cajal achieved. Now, as you zoom back, you see that this is only a thin section that's only six layers thick of this mouse brain. So, neurons are great. They have these elaborate cell bodies. They form these networks, but so do glia. As you go up the evolutionary tree from lower animals to higher, you get more glia per neuron the higher you go up on the evolutionary tree. If you raise an animal in an enriched environment, you will get more glia. The brain gets thicker, it's because you get more glia. And if that doesn't interest you, uh, when Marion Diamond, here at UC Berkeley, looked at the brain of Albert Einstein to try and understand why he was so intelligent, she couldn't find any difference in his neurons, but what she found is, is that um, he had more glia, more glia uh, in the parts of the brain involved in imagination. So that's just an observation, doesn't prove anything, but it really uh, intrigued people that glia might be doing more than we think. So, physiologists, how do, how do we mishap the brain? Well, we use the wrong tools. Physiologists um, um, use tools to study electrical signals, but glia don't communicate using electricity. So uh, let me invite you into my lab, and I'll show you how physiologists study the brain. The first thing we do is we dissect out the part we want. This is the hippocampus of a rat. Then we slice it very thin, 400 microns thick in this case, so that we can keep this tissue alive. Then we put this brain slice into uh, uh, a uh, Faraday cage, because we have to exclude all the electrical interference in our modern environment. We use amplifiers and uh, stimulators so that we can record the weak signals in neurons and synapses. Here I'm studying something called LTP, where the synapse gets strengthened during a memory. Um, the tissue is kept alive in artificial cerebral spinal fluid, warmed, oxygenated, and um, uh, then we use these electrodes to stimulate and record the electrical activity. The point is, all of this is useless because glia don't communicate with electricity. So what broke it open? What broke it open the other brain was kids playing video games because playing video games drove the development of faster computers, color monitors, better video cameras. So scientists grafted all that technology onto the microscope. In the past, we just used formaldehyde, fixed the tissue, stained it, and looked at dead tissue. But now, with a video camera on the microscope, we could look at living tissue. And new dyes were developed that work like this, a glow stick where when two compounds get mixed, it creates light. This led to something called calcium imaging, where dyes were developed that calcium, when calcium was added, glowed. Why was that important? Because when neurons fire, calcium ions come in. So this would allow us to put a dye in brain tissue and watch neurons fire electrical activity uh, and use a microscope instead of using uh, electrical recording. And it was so exciting when we first did this to see neurons firing, uh, but it exposed the other brain. So here is um, a textbook view of the, of the neuron synapses. Always leaves out this part. Um, it's really the part comprised of astrocytes. We can find out what these cells are doing by using calcium imaging. Um, as I'll show you here, we put a calcium dye in with astrocytes. Pseudocolor, so more calcium is bright red. Watch what's happening. These cells are communicating. And they're not using electricity. They're communicating with waves of calcium. And watch this. When I stimulate the neurons here, it'll look like lightning bolts. There, the astrocytes responded. So now we have non-electric communication going through brain cells, not neurons, responding to electrical activity in neurons, no synapses, all outside the neuron doctrine. Why are they doing this? How are they doing this? So um, quickly discovered how they're doing this, and you can participate in the same way, because the Peter Guthrie loaned me this image, which was this experiment in which they did an experiment to test. One idea is calcium might just go through the cell membrane through gap junctions, which are kinds of channels between cells, and that's how calcium waves go through tissue. So to prove that, they made a fire break. So they just scratched off the cells here in culture, started a calcium wave here, and if this is the way it worked, then uh, the signaling should stop at the fire break. So now you can see the same way they did, the first time they did their experiment, what happened. 
Glial cells communicate by broadcasting signals. They don't have to be touching. Those signals are neurotransmitters. It quickly uh, it turned out that glial cells, astrocytes, have the same neurotransmitter receptors that neurons have to communicate at synapses. And they're releasing the same neurotransmitters. That means that they can communicate, but they can also interact with signaling uh, that's going on with neurons at synapses. So uh, we understand that neural communication via the neuron doctrine takes place by neurotransmitters going from presynaptic to the postsynaptic membrane. Of course, there's never anything else shown, but let's take a look at here at glia. These are actual glial cells, astrocytes. When the neurotransmitter is released, it definitely signals to the other cell, but it's also picked up by the astrocyte. The astrocyte, in turn, releases neurotransmitters that can regulate, it can augment or, or inhibit synaptic transmission. So astrocytes can control the strength of the synapse. And because they can signal among each other without electricity, they can send that signal to a different part of the brain, release uh, signaling compounds and neurotransmitters to control a synapse in a different part of the brain that's not wired to this part through a non-electric mechanism of communication through non-neurons. That's what I call the other brain. And um, so this, I think, is so fascinating. Here's another picture. I just love watching these cells communicating. So we're 100 years behind understanding glia, uh, again, from Mark Ellisman's lab. We don't know the basic things about their morphology. They're really complicated. They uh, fill all the space between neurons and interact with the synapses. And what was recently discovered, a big surprise, is that they form non-overlapping domains. So they divide up the cerebral cortex into separate domains. We don't know why, but it seems that astrocytes may impose a higher level of structure on information processing in the brain. Um, you can look at a neuron from a, a rat, and it's identical to a neuron in, in, in a human. Not true for astrocytes. Human astrocytes are unique. They're even different from primate astrocytes. They're huge. One human astrocyte can encompass two million synapses. And in an interesting experiment by uh, Nettergaard and Goldman, they transplanted human astrocytes into mice, and it made these mice brilliant. They um, ran, they ran um, mazes quicker, uh, and synapses uh, strengthened much easier. Um, Moving on to other things astrocytes do. Astrocytes are associated with blood vessels. I told you they take neurotransmitters. They dump the, the waste uh, from, neuro, from synapses and neurons into the bloodstream. They also take nutrients out of the bloodstream and deliver them to the neurons. Look at this intricate structure. If you can see, they're interacting with synapses. But this also involves astrocytes and all kinds of vascular disorders. Astrocytes also control blood flow. This is from Eric Newman's lab. Here's a blood vessel in the retina. Here's an astrocyte, and he stimulated the neurons to fire by shining a light. You'll see that here with a yellow dot, and look what happens to the uh, blood vessel. Astrocytes control the local swelling and constriction of blood vessels in the brain, so in response to neural activity. You may be familiar with fMRI, which is used to image activity in the brain, that's based on local blood flow. It doesn't sense neural activity directly. It's sensing oxygenated hemoglobin, and the astrocytes are controlling that lo local blood flow. Neural degenerative diseases overlooked glia, and now we know they're involved in all kinds of disorders, ALS, Parkinson's, epilepsy. No time to go into it. Brain cancer has almost nothing to do with neurons because neurons don't divide. But, uh, and cancer is runaway cell division. But um, new uh, research uh, directing, uh, developing new drugs that can target these brain cells is leading to new therapies uh, to treat brain cancer. And here, this one's homing right in on the cancer, better than surgery. Um, this was a surprise. Astrocytes and glia involved in psychiatric illnesses. Schizophrenia, bipolar depression are all associated with changes in astrocytes and in other glia. We understand these are all disorders of synaptic transmission, and we treat them with SSRIs and other drugs to control synaptic transmission. Well, what's the cell that does this in the brain normally? Astrocytes. So astrocytes could be the cause or, or be involved in a number of psychiatric conditions because they stabilize the environment, they release neurotransmitters and growth factors and whatnot. In fact, you know, um, the, the discoveries are often made and then forgotten. The, 
electroshock therapy that's used for treating depression, still a most effective treatment for depression that can't be treated in other ways. Where did that crazy idea come from of shocking a person's brain and curing them of schizophrenia or depression? It came from Vladislav Maduna, who uh, in the 1930s was a pathologist, and he noticed people who died of schizophrenia and depression had fewer astrocytes in their brain, and people who died of epilepsy had too many. So he just said, oh, these disorders are caused by an imbalance of, epile uh, imbalance of astrocytes. So he induced a seizure to try to make more astrocytes and cure schizophrenia and depression. And now we don't know that that's how it works, but considering all of the growth factors and, and functions that astrocytes carry out, they're certainly likely to be part of it, and new drugs could be treated to that. There are four kinds of glia so far. I've only talked about astrocytes. The brain has its own immune cell isolated from the bloodstream by the blood-brain barrier, and these are called microglia. And in these experiments by the Gan lab, um, engineered a mouse genetically so that the microglia fluoresced green. Then he put a window in the cranium and stuck the mouse's head under the microscope and looked into the brain, and then could see what these microglia are doing. Um, and then he, in addition, he created an injury with a laser beam, and here's what they found. These cells were dynamic, they were moving. Um, and when you create an injury, they were like Marines descending on this. It could be a bacteria or a virus or an injury to uh, deal with this. So this is going on in your brain right now. Those little fingers are going around checking your synapses for damage and whatnot. Um, glia are involved in infectious disease. A good example is HIV doesn't even affect neurons. Yet there's uh, dementia in HIV, um, but it does affect uh, astrocytes. In Alzheimer's, um, ever since Alzheimer's described uh, uh, the, the disorder, he noticed microglia involved, and also these plaques. Well, these amyloid plaques are surrounded by microglia, but we now can see that they're eating the amyloid involved in Alzheimer's. And this was thought to be just a reaction to pathology, but now you realize, well, what if they don't carry out this function normally throughout life? That could cause Alzheimer's. And in fact, new research is showing that microglia become senescent ahead of the neuronal um, dysfunctions in, in, in the brain. Considering, uh, indicating a role of microglia in initiating Alzheimer's. Chronic pain is also involves, um, and morphine addiction also involves microglia. Um, and chronic pain is the pain that won't go away after your injury heals. Um, you have an injury to the peripheral nerve. It turns out that, uh, that the microglia inside the spinal cord become reactive. They change. They start to release uh, substances like cytokines and, uh, and other factors that make neurons excitable. So your pain neurons are firing because the uh, microglia are stimulating them. That, um, and here uh, you can see the microglia releasing these uh, vesicles full of all of these kinds of uh, substances that excite neurons and cause pain. This is also important in opiate addiction because opiates decrease neural activity. Turns out microglia release substances to bring it back to normal, and you ratchet up so that you now need more and more and more morphine. And if you block it, the morphine, then you have this terrible rebound. So microglia are involved in that. There are also an, uh, another interesting aspect of microglia is that many people will take marijuana to control pain and inflammation. Uh, they don't want the cognitive side effects. It turns out that the receptor that is uh, important in inflammation and pain is on microglia, not on neurons. It's called a CB2 receptor, and this is leading to new drugs that can treat pain and not involve, not have the cognitive effects. Now, I want to end with um, myelin-forming cells. These cells form electrical insulation on the axons. We've cut an axon here in half, nerve fiber, and it's wrapped around this membrane of insulation like electrical tape. Schwann cells, spindle-shaped cells, do that in your arms and trunk, the peripheral nervous system, and these octopus uh, cells do this in the central nervous system, a very different cell. Now, I want to show you the experiment that got me into neuron glia interactions, and this looks a little old because this is uh, old technology, but I put DRG neurons, which are sensory neurons, the ones that sense pain and, and touch in culture, these big round circles here, and then I added Schwann cells. I stimulated the neurons to fire. I used that calcium dye, and certainly the neurons responded. But then, to my surprise, the Schwann cells did. No synapses. Again, why is this happening? How does it happen? What are the consequences? That's what got me interested. Then I moved into the central nervous system because oligodendrocytes are the myelin-forming cells in the central nervous system. Cells unlike any other cell in the body can wrap uh, 
up to 100 layers of membrane around an axon through 50 different processes simultaneously? Could they be involved in cognitive function? So myelinating glia change the way impulses are transmitted. They accelerate the speed of transmission by constraining impulses to be generated only at these bare patches every millimeter or so along the axon. So they act like repeaters. So vertebrates are the only animals that have myelin, and the conduction velocity is 50 times faster. Half the brain is composed of white matter. Um, the gray matter is what you hear about. That's where the neurons are and dendrites. But the white matter is all bundles of these axons. And by and large, people ignored white matter um, because the interesting stuff was going on up here, according to the neuron doctrine. The human brain, half of it is white matter, more than any other animal. A mouse brain's only 10% because we have so many connections. Um, and we can see these here with imaging DTI. Um, so I'm going to show you here what white matter looks like. I showed you uh, similar images of gray matter. Uh, this is, again, serial electron microscopy. The, I need to make the point that the structure of myelin is submicroscopic. You can't see it with a light microscope, so you need electron microscopy. So we go through, we look, this is, happens to be optic nerve. Here's a capillary, axons. When we find a node of Ronvia, we can trace it, put that in the computer. This is only uh, one half a micron distance, um, and then we can reconstruct the structure of the node of Ronvier. This is understood that myelin is important in demyelinating disorders like multiple sclerosis, because if you have a conduction block, conduction failure, you're going to have a functional failure. But I wondered, could myelin be involved in learning? And here's, the evidence, here's what intrigued me, that imaging began to show that all kinds of neurological diseases had changes in white matter. This is just brain imaging. Things like dyslexia, autism, stuttering, psychiatric disorders associated with changes in white matter. It's, these are synaptic uh, disorders. And differences in cognitive ability associated with white matter differences. If you're good at music or bad at music, if you're good at arithmetic or bad, there were differences in white matter structure. Okay, now we're not talking about dysfunction. We're talking about normal ranges of function. So, Another important thing to know about white matter and myelin is that it's not done at birth. It takes place throughout life, uh, and it's shown here in uh, increasing colors of blue in the human brain. From the back of the cortex to the front, prefrontal cortex is not myelinated until your early 20s. That's also uh, why the prefrontal cortex judgment, um, higher ex level executive function can't really take place until the early uh, 20s. That's when we give legal responsibility. But the question is, why? If it was just insulation, why wasn't it done when you were born? Why do we see myelin taking place over childhood and adolescence, where we understand, experience, sculpts, and guides the, the connections in the brain? So this led to a theory that uh, myelin could be plastic and involved in learning. And I think um, this was a head scratcher, but it'd probably be really uh, obvious to you <laughs> working in the internet. Um, and this is what we're calling activity-dependent myelin. Uh, myelin's function is to regulate conduction velocity, speed impulse conduction. We like to think of the human brain as the most complicated network in the universe. And to do any kind of cognitive function, you need to send information from one relay point to another to another, you know, in order to carry out this function. I don't know about the internet, but I know in transportation, the most important thing is when I get to my relay point. You know, if I'm flying to San Francisco, I need to get my connection in Chicago simultaneously with my connecting flight. If I get there too late, it doesn't work. If I get there five hours early, that's not optimal, has a lot of disadvantages. We know that the conduction speed through all of these uh, pathways in the brain varies from a slow walk, pace of a slow walk, to the pace of a Ferrari. How did all those speeds get set? If they're not set right, then you'll have dysfunction. Um, and so it seemed to me likely that maybe functional feedback experience could change the myelination and then therefore uh, promote synchrony, the spike time arrival. So that's how myelin could be involved. Uh, studies in other labs have shown that after learning, um, there are changes in white matter. Here's juggling, but it's been done with classroom learning, video game learning, every kind of learning you can think of. But now we're completely uncharted waters. <laughs> and we've always been thinking of the synapse. Um, but now, if we're going to involve myelin in learning, there's so many questions. This has to be uh, not synaptic communication, but action potentials. 
How do myelinating glia sense activity in axons? There are no synapses. How would it modify myelin? Would it be important in information processing and learning? And just how plastic is myelin? People think of it as static. So in my lab, we do our studies in cell culture. We have electrodes. We put in sensory neurons here. Then we put on uh, myelinating glia oligodendrocytes. We stimulate them in culture any way we want. And we can study the effects of neural activity on myelination. We can do gene analysis on the glial cells and see how they respond to electrical firing. We can block signals with like neurotransmitters and understand how this communication is taking place. We can do calcium imaging. Here's an oligo on axons that are red. And when I stimulate the axons, the oligodendrocyte responds, no synapses, not neuron doctrine. And if I put in botulinum toxin, which blocks vesicle release, and stimulate the neurons, the oligodendrocyte still responded. That tells us that in addition to vesicles uh, releasing neurotransmitters, there are non-vesicular means, like channels that are releasing neurotransmitters, all kinds of mechanisms of communication, activity dependent, that we've ignored because we're so focused on the synapse. Our work has shown that electrical activity promotes the initiation of myelination. This means that electrically active axons are preferentially myelinated. So as you're learning to play the piano, those pathways become preferentially myelinated. We've identified a number of the cellular mechanisms, the signals involved uh, over the years. This is from our lab and other labs are finding new signals. The whole point is that we're likely to find as many mechanisms of myelin plasticity as there are for synaptic plasticity. That's just that we're just getting started. And the most recent work is uh, Richardson's lab used a mouse genetically modified so that it couldn't form new myelin and trained it to run on this wheel missing rungs and it learned more slowly. So myelin facilitated learning in this case. So here's what the neuron doctrine left out. <laughs> Astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, Schwann cells, microglia, and all this communication, rich communication going on among these cells. All types of glia sense and respond to neural activity. Glia communicate with each other and with neurons. They regulate the neuronal brain. They're central to psychiatric neurological disorders. And myelin speeds impulse uh, uh, conduction may be very important as a new cellular mechanism of learning to promote synchrony and optimal flow of information through complex networks. Um, but it's important that, um, hmm. okay, I had some other things and they're not sure, oh, there it is. That, um, you know, the neuron doctrine doesn't work without glia, I don't think. The, the glia work in different ways. They work on, uh, they broadcast signals and neurons communicate serially. They communicate slowly. Every movie I showed you was sped up. But you know, if, if glia did the same thing as neurons, why would we have them? So we have to look at glia through a different lens. Um, and this offers new possibilities for new drugs and alternative treatments that were, are directed towards glia. Um, and if you want to know more, this is the book. And the, what I tried to capture in this book was the excitement of neuroscientists on the cusp of a new vision of the brain that completely overturned uh, previous thinking. And I wanted to capture that moment. This happens in science all the time in every field. And this is what's happening right now in brain science. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. We're going to take some questions. Feel free to come up to the mic and, and ask questions. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, so if I understood correctly, um, uh, glia cells like regulate functioning of the neuronal part of the brain. Like, for example, when we see activity in the fMRI, uh, that sort of glia or astrocyte specifically regulating like what parts get activated. Uh, is, is that correct? That's correct. So uh, gl the glia are sensing neural activity and they're responding to it and they're modulating neural activity. Uh, and they're modulating uh, also local blood flow. So, you know, fMRI is interesting. You know, we take it for granted that you can look at, you, you can put, give someone a cognitive task and look in the brain and see what part of the brain, what circuitry is involved. But you realize we're doing that by looking at blood, local blood flow, and astrocytes are controlling that. But that raises the bigger question, what if that didn't happen? So right now, as we're talking, different parts of our brain are being activated, probably, and that means that astrocytes are controlling local blood flow. If that didn't happen, what would happen to cognition? The neurons wouldn't get enough uh, uh, glucose, and uh, they would build up too much potassium. So, uh, you know, Beyond its importance in, in imaging, it raises a really fundamental question that I think is really not explored, is you know, how glia and blood flow is actually controlling our cognition or allowing it to take place. Mm -hmm. uh, are we um, anywhere close to like, learning how to regulate 
glia so like how to regulate the regulation if, if we wanted to yeah, do that we like are, to, to enhance focus and learning and things like exactly. that. exactly so we have to get new tools this is very hard uh, and uh, there are new tools being developed i also have to say uh, part of the reason we overlooked half the brain is the nature of how science works right if you worked on unimportant cells in uh, you weren't likely to get grants. Your papers didn't get published in big journals. Nobody heard about it. People's careers were really stifled because they worked on glial cells. And now we have that problem. We understand that glial are important, but if you work on synaptic transmission, um, as a neurophysiologist, you're not necessarily eager to have that picture complicated, bring in another cell, whole other kind of technique, and so the field is struggling right now to uh, make advances, to get new techniques that everyone will accept. Um, and there is this enormous, uh, almost a conflict of interest, right? Because if you're studying synaptic transmission, you don't want to understand, you don't want to have to start studying myelin, right? But uh, new tools need to be developed and people are working very hard to make them. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's a very interesting talk uh, about in the SNAP. You said yes. the seals actually get trained not to react like, uh, uh, like uh, have those SNAPs. What, so what kind of training they receive? I'm very curious. Well, the Navy works on these, and he described some of the, uh, they have exercises to, uh, to teach them to control these, uh, these aggressive responses. So they have very specific programs. I mean, one was they called the uh, hooded, uh, they put a hood on them and then they take off the hood and there's all kinds of threats around them. Um, there might be a hostage situation or something and they have to analyze very systematically what are the threats, prioritize them. In other words, they rely on cognitive function to break down and, uh, the threats and respond, not just on a gut level. At the same time, you talk to these guys, and I also interviewed a lot of fascinating people, you know, Secret Service, but also sports figures. They also rely on their gut. I mean, they'll walk into a, a, a building in Afghanistan and say, you know, this just doesn't feel right. And they'll leave and find out that there's, you know, and it blows up when they walk out the door. And that's because your threat detection mechanism is fast, I told you, that's one reason. And it's fast, but it's also much more capable of handling enormous amounts of information, right? We can hold eight digits in our mind at once. That's pathetic in our consciousness, all right? That's why we can't do long division. We can't, it's not difficult, but we can't hold that intermediate answer long enough to do the next step. Your unconscious brain is constantly crunching an enormous amount of data about your internal state, your external state. That's how I was able to do that in Barcelona. That's what amazed me is that we all have this ability um, to constantly survey for dangers. And so people do learn, who work at high levels uh, of performance, do learn to trust their gut and how to develop that as well. So it takes both. Athletes do the same thing. I have some stories about athletes and avalanches and skiers and things where they rely on the gut. But think about it. the most complicated decisions we make in life, we don't do rationally, right? Who to marry, you know, where to live. You can't make a spreadsheet and come up. You, you rely on your gut. And that's because there's too much information, too many unknowns. Our brain processes images and uh, experiences differently from the way we process logical information or math, computer science, for example. And I've noticed that some Asian orators can basically uh, deliver a speech for hours without looking for any note. And also like uh, very genius like uh, Tesla and, uh, and Da Vinci, right? They see their invention. For example, Tesla was able to see the, the, the detailed picture of DC generator before he actually did any detailed work. And uh, in, in the past few years, I've been trying to uh, kind of combine these kind of techniques and uh, try to apply that in computer science. For example, I, in, in uh, data structure, in, uh, in architecture stuff, I try to map that to uh, nursery information. Like when I walk through nursery, I get a lot of inspiration. The way the range of the flowers, the trees, everything, right? So my question to, for you is, um, how, can you shed some light on how our brain works uh, in terms of rec recalling experience? For example, your experience in Barcelona is so vivid, right? You jump to the street, you got into a taxi, it cost you 176 euros to evade from tax. Right? It's, it's so vivid, so you will never forget about that. Right. Versus some math formula or some computer science data structure, it will be more difficult to recall. 
So how do you, if we combine these two parts of brain and work, work together, and what, can you shed some light on underlying scientific mechanisms? Well, those are good questions. You've combined a couple of questions. So first, in terms of what goes into memory, memory is not about recording the past. I mean, do you want to remember that great parking place you had at Target three years ago? I mean, most of what we experience during the day, we forget. Um, and uh, so what, what you remember are experiences that are likely to have significance for the future survival value. And so as you go to sleep at night, you relive your experiences of the day, and that's when uh, short-term memories get converted to long-term memories. My lab's done research on this as well. Um, and so things that uh, are novel are likely to be important for the future. Um, you know, if you, if you um, have bad food at a restaurant, you know, you don't need to do it twice. You're, you're not going to eat that again. So there's, so emotion, and we understand very much about the physiology, about how that works. Emotion is one of the things, novelty is one of the things that converts short-term memory to long-term memory. Your second question was about vision. Human beings, vision is an extremely important sense for human beings. Um, not true for uh, mice and other animals. Um, and we have an amazing capacity, you're right. I mean, uh, there, ha I'm, there have been studies, and I don't want to give the wrong answer, but you can look through a magazine that you've looked through a couple of years ago and identify every picture. Yeah, I've seen that picture. We don't, you know, and that's normal. We have an amazing capacity for visual memory. That is because a third of our cerebral cortex is devoted to vision. It's such an important process for us. I interviewed somebody in the book who was a blind person who's congenitally blind, and uh, she doesn't have pigment in her, in her retina. And so, you know, there's no question about it being, um, being uh, you know, malingering or something. We, put her in that, we did put her in an fMRI, and she can't see. But a third of her cortex is sitting there with nothing to do. So what happens is other senses get wired to the cortex. She can um, see pictures by putting her fingers over a page. And she's probably picking up on little thermal dif distance differences. We could do this maybe if we practiced. I mean, we could all play the violin, I suppose, <laughs> um, in theory. But um, she's using this enormous brain power that has nothing to do normally uh, devoted to vision. She can uh, echolocate walking around. She has tremendous synesthesia because her senses get mixed. She can uh, hear, uh, she can read five times faster than anyone else, uh, than a sighted person. Uh, and it just turns up the speed until it sounds like gibberish and it's no problem for her to decode it because the brain power is devoted to it. So it's true, vision is very important. And, we, and, and people who do have these remarkable abilities for memory, one of the tricks they always use is to make an image, you know, and they make some, concoct some image of a you know, monkey sitting on a chair that reminds them of something else. They create this big scene and then they just describe the scene. Yeah? Uh, so I just had a quick question. Um, so what advances, I guess, are in imaging technology are gonna be needed to kind of really continue to progress uh, the study of glia cells? Yeah, uh, well, I'm working on some of my labs that allow me to look at myelin structure uh, in a living mouse um, without any dyes or genetic engineering, um, using new spectro uh, uh, spectroscopy methods adapted to imaging. Um, I think there's a lot of development in imaging. The, the two-photon and the confocal imaging have been a great help. Fiber optic cameras have been a great help. Really building cameras uh, uh, building microscopes that are miniature microscopes that can be put on the skull and uh, with, connected with a fiber optic lens into the brain and then we can see neurons firing. So there's, that's one area. There's a lot of area because optogenetic stimulates neurons with light of uh, being able to direct laser beams so that you can not just stimulate you know, a whole bunch of tissue but you can target individual cells, imagine that. And, and begin to decode this network, because you can activate specific cells in any sequence, and you can record the responses with the camera to all of these, this whole population, things you could never do with an electrode. Well, not never, never say never, but very hard to do with electrodes. Thank you. Okay, I wish we had more time, but we're gonna wrap up. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, and thanks to Dr. Douglas Fields. This was really fascinating. Thank you very much.